I'm Chris Neal, uh, and a member of the Shelms of Science and Engineering Society, uh, and somebody who has a very particular interest in radar. Uh, my father had been the chief engineer at Marconi Radar. Well, we're here today because um, we're celebrating the fact that the tower behind me, over there, um, received grade two listing status last year. That means it uh, has, it will be preserved. Um, it means that it cannot be demolished and it has to be uh, maintained um, and as an appropriate uh, memorial really to the um, efforts of uh, everybody during the First, Second World War. This uh, particular tower was originally at Canoodon and it would have shared the site with similar types of towers. And those towers' purpose was to beam radio waves out across the North Sea. Um, and this was done uh, before the Second World War started, was part of the new air defence system that was developed prior to the Second World War. Well, this was part of what was called Chain Home. And it was Chain Home because it was a chain of radar stations that would eventually stretch from the Orkney Islands all the way down the North Sea coast along the Ch English Channel and then up into the Irish Sea. And that provided this complete uh, uh, curtain of radio waves all the way around the coast, which meant that any enemy aircraft that approached our coast from over 100 miles would be detected. Now that's something we all take for granted these days because radar systems have become extremely well developed and are all around us. But back in the uh, early, early 1930s, no such thing existed. When the threat of enemy bombers coming over to this country to bomb London and city, other cities, there was a major concern as to how we would be able to detect them in time to scramble our fighters to go and intercept them. So in the early 1930s, with the threat of German bombers looming ever possible, major effort was undertaken to try and develop some techniques for detecting aircraft at some distance away from our coast. At that time, we were very dependent on the Observer Corps keeping a watch on the sky and reporting to Central Command any possible aircraft approaching the country. One of the big hopes at the time was that you could actually use sound systems to detect the sound of engines, uh, aircraft engines um, that would give you some idea of what was approaching uh, and from what direction. As part of an experiment to determine how effective sound uh, detection was, a 250 foot concrete parabola was built on Romney Marsh. Uh, and this was a, a concave mirror effectively that pointed out over the English Channel. As any aircraft would have approached it, the sound would have reflected off the concrete uh, mirror uh, into an array of microphones and would give some idea of there being an aircraft out there and what direction it was coming from. But the reality was that technique maybe at best would give you a 15 mile warning of a approaching aircraft. But with different types of weather around that was not an accurate uh, measurement. It could vary from day to day and so it was really not a very promising technique. Meanwhile, other methods were being looked at. And at the time, the death ray was very popular in science fiction. And a person named Robert Watson Watt was asked to determine whether or not it was possible to build a death ray. Uh, he asked his assistant, Arnold Wilkins, to do some calculations to, put, to see whether it was possible to build a death ray which would mean pointing radio waves at an oncoming aircraft and effectively disabling the pilot. Well, they did the calculations and found that there was nothing around that could produce anywhere near enough radio waves in order to do that. But what they did realize was that when you shoot the radio waves at an approaching aircraft, some of them would be reflected back. 
So if you could detect those radio waves, which would be very small compared with the power that went out, you would have an idea of an approaching aircraft and you could even use it to determine its distance and the direction. So in 1935 they did an experiment to prove this in Daventry in Northamptonshire and they were able to demonstrate that you certainly could detect the reflected radio waves from an approaching aircraft uh, and they were able to do that just on that first experiment they could detect the aircraft out to about eight miles. That counted as a success and the consequences of that was that the Air Chief Marshal Dowding awarded £10,000 to develop this into a viable radar system, as we would now call it. So that was the beginning of the development of a radar system called Chain Home. And Chain, because there would be a string of radar stations around the coast, and Home because this was on home territory, i.e. the British Isles. Later on, such chains were put on some of our overseas possessions and they were called overseas. This tower behind me is an example of the towers that were built for those radar stations. This particular one was based was in, Can in Canoodon uh, and was part of a radar station that had three such towers on it. By about one year before the war, 15 of these radar stations had already been built and they ran from Bordsey in Suffolk around the Thames estuary to Dover and they provided the very first uh, radio detection of aircraft that could approach London. By the time of the Second World War, 1st of September 1939, a further number of radar stations had been built and commissioned and at the outbreak of war there were radar stations all the way round from Orkney round to Ventnor on the Isle of Wight and eventually the chain was extended all the way up to the Irish Sea. Well, my father was one of the, uh, what we call radar mechanics for the RAF. He joined the RAF in 1940, age 20, uh, and his first job, his first posting, was up in the Orkney Islands as a radar mechanic uh, with the responsibility, along with his colleagues there, to maintain, calibrate uh, and operate uh, the radar station in the Orkney Islands um, and its purpose there was to guard Scarpa Flow which was the uh, Royal Navy's main base during the war which is in fact was actually bombed by the Germans a few days after the declaration of war so it was a fairly important radar station that uh, uh, was built at, uh, on the Orkney Islands. Subsequently Throughout the war my father was working on various radar systems both in this country uh, and in the Middle East. And after the war uh, he joined the Marconi company who at that time had a major contract to upgrade all of the UK's radar defence system. Uh, and he was with the Marconi companies basically until he died. And the Marconi Company had a major contract from the MOD to upgrade all of the World War II chain home system to make it suitable for the threats posed by the Cold War. Well, the, obviously, when Marconi's got that contract, the first thing they did was to <clears throat> look for as many of the RAF radar mechanics that, they, uh, that were about um, to employ them um, to participate in this upgrade program. Clearly they knew the systems uh, and they were able to do the, uh, the upgrades, the modifications that were necessary to meet the new requirements. He stayed with the Marconi company right through to the end of his career, uh, which he finished as uh, 
chief engineer of the Marconi Radar Company. And he spent the majority of his career in the buildings right behind me and underneath that CH tower that you can see on the uh, image. One of the fascinating things I find is that I have a photograph of him when he was in the Orkney Islands, aged 20, and he's po it's posed in such a way that one of these, or two of these, uh, CH towers are in the background. And I think little did he know back in, in 1940 that um, he would spend the majority of his career in the shadow of another CH tower, albeit this one having come from Canoodon. Marconi's in the early 50s received a, a, a contract from the MOD to uh, develop the guidance system for Blue Streak and they needed a tower like the tower behind me to do some of the trials on. The MOD uh, made one available as they were in the process of demolishing all the towers at Canoodon and the tower, one of the towers was saved and brought here to Bado and re-erected in the early 1950s. The reason that this tower therefore is uh, listed is because it is now the only complete CH tower. It has all its uh, wings or gantries uh, and it is just as it would have looked in the uh, Second World War. There are a few others around that do not have the gantries on them any longer but this is the only one which is complete hence the reason that it has been listed. Well, there's been quite a few people over the years who've attempted to get uh, listing status for the tower and most previously it was rejected on the basis that the tower was not on its original site. But I think probably earlier on there may well have been other towers that still had gantries on them so it didn't seem quite so much that the existence of a unique tower would be at threat. Um, but now, as I said, it is the only one left with its gant all of its gantries. And I think the uh, historic England were looking for projects, uh, World War II related projects, to uh, celebrate the, or to uh, remember the, um, the Battle of Britain. Uh, and they uh, re-examined the uh, case for listing. Uh, and there's one particular person that I, I really would say was the driving force behind this that last attempt and that was a guy named Daniel Black who worked in the um, buildings behind me at the time. Um, he had the tenacity to keep on uh, attempting to get the listing which we ex eventually succeeded in doing. But what's the future do you think? Is this going to become like board seat? A Marconi Museum? <laughs> I'm not aware of any, uh, any, any plans amongst anybody at the moment that would um, bring anything else to the site. I think it's really, I think you almost got to regard it as like a statue which can be seen from many parts of Essex. I mean one of the points I made to uh, Historic England was uh, I used to work abroad quite a lot and I always remember coming back to Essex and the first thing that I could see if you were coming back on the train from Liverpool Street Station or driving by car, in the distance was the tower at Bado. And you kind of thought, right, that's it, we're back home. Um, it's, um, it's there to really to remind people of the, F, the heroic efforts that were undertaken during the war not only by the people that manned the stations and maintained them and built them, but of course also the pioneers under Watts and Watt um, that did the development work in the first place. You have the Statue of Liberty in America. Yep. And right here in Bado, we've got the... Tower you got the Tower of Liberty. of Liberty. Yes, no, that's a very you good point. You that line? <laughs> yes, the Tower of Liberty. Yes. Uh, and which is a visible, anybody flying from the continent, certainly from the German direction, um, will see that tower out of the aircraft windows. That particular tower and the few hundred other ones that were built around the coast of this country, you and I would be uh, probably having this interview in German um, and probably under the uh, 
Nazi regime would be far from uh, living with liberty. So you could argue it's probably more relevant to liberty even than the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty literally was a symbol that just says America welcomes anybody and they can be freed from whatever oppressive regimes exist in their own countries. Um, this Tower of Liberty prevented oppression in the British Isles. Thank you.